Starting, all attendees are in listen-only mode. Good afternoon, and thank you for attending the STN monthly webinar. This session is being recorded so that it can be offered as an on-demand CE for our members. Your lines are muted, but if you have questions during today's presentation, please type them into the question queue, and we will address them at the end, time permitting. STN is an accredited provider of continuing nursing education. To claim CE for this session, you must attend the entire session and complete the online evaluation of the presentation. If you are attending the session live, you will receive an email about one hour after the event with directions to complete the evaluation. Certificates will be emailed approximately 7 to 14 days after today's event. If you are viewing this session as on-demand CE, you will be able to download your certificate after completing the quiz and the evaluation. Today's session is interactive and will include several online polls. We hope that you gain great value from our educational session. Today's speaker is Dr. Bill Hampton. Dr. Hampton is a full-time emergency, emergency physician and has been board certified in emergency medicine since 2007. He is also clinical assistant professor of emergency medicine and clinical assistant professor of osteopathic manipulative medicine at the Chicago College of Osteopathic Medicine, Midwestern University. In addition to his busy lecture schedule, he completes around 200 hours of continuing medical education annually himself. Dr. Hampton le lectures nationally and internationally on a variety of emergency medicine topics for diverse audiences, including the Emergency Nurses Association Annual and Leadership Conferences, the Canadian National Emergency Nurses Association Annual Conference, the Society for Emergency Medicine Physician Assistance Annual Conference, American College of Emergency Physicians Scientific, Scientific Assembly, the University of Calgary Urgent Care Conference, and the American College of Osteopathic Emergency Physicians Spring Seminar. He has lectured in California, Florida, Idaho, Illinois, Indiana, Louisiana, Michigan, Minnesota, Nevada, North Carolina, Oregon, South Carolina, Tennessee, Texas, and Wisconsin. Dr. Hampton, Hampton's lectures have also been featured on Quantia MD, an online physician education site. In his free time, Dr. Hampton enjoys serving as adjunct faculty for Trump trumpet performance at Silver Lake College in Manitowoc. He also teaches a weekly yoga class at Holy Families Wellness Center. He is married with four children, the oldest, a sophomore in college, the youngest, infant twins. Please welcome Dr. Hampton. Cody, thanks very much. Hi, everybody. We are going to have an excellent session today. I'm looking forward to it. This is one of my favorite topics to, start, to talk about, so let's get started. Adult Trauma, Clinical Decision Rules. Our objectives today, explain statistical sensitivity and specificity and apply that knowledge in the evaluation of clinical decision rules. Discuss the various adult trauma clinical decision rules, how they were derived. Compare and contrast the rules for head injury, neck injury, chest and abdominal trauma, as well as lower extremity injuries in adult trauma patients. And finally, talk about the importance of CDRs in the triage, diagnostic testing, and correctly dispositioning our trauma patients. I have nothing to disclose. There's no conflict of interest relative to this educational activity. The Society of Trauma Nurses is accredited, as you've already heard, and this event has been awarded 1.0 contact hours. Keep in mind the enduring materials for the on-demand webinar will expire on January 31, 2016. To complete it, you have to do it. Stick around, participate in the polls. I really look forward to this, and I hope you enjoy the cases. On a busy shift at a local emergency department, you are placed in triage and presented with a variety of patients. Or perhaps you work at a teaching hospital and are particularly concerned about patient safety come every July. Or perhaps you are a nurse practitioner at a critical access emergency department and you want to refine your telemedicine trauma referrals. Or perhaps you simply would like to be more comfortable in assessing and caring for critically injured patients. Regardless of your reason for wanting to learn more, I promise these will help, make, help you make better clinical decisions, smarter clinical decisions, and be more confident in your decisions. We do have to talk about some statistical definitions very briefly. 
Imagine a study evaluating a new test that screens people for a disease. Each person taking the test either has the disease or does not have the disease. The test can be positive, in other words, predicting that the patient has the disease, or negative, predicting that the patient does not have the disease. The test results for each subject may or may not match the subject's actual status. True positive means sick people that are correctly diagnosed as sick. False positive are healthy people incorrectly identified as sick. True negative, healthy people correctly identified as healthy. False negative, sick people incorrectly identified as healthy. In general, when we say positive, if that seems confusing to you, substitute the word identified. And if negative seems confusing to you, substitute the word rejected. True positives are patients that are correctly identified. False positives are incorrectly identified. True negative, correctly rejected. False negative, incorrectly rejected. One more, two more thoughts about sensitivity and specificity. And the mnemonic I like for these is snout and spin. Imagine that everyone in your nurse department developed upper respiratory symptoms, and someone suggested it might be Legionnaires. Everyone has symptoms, but you want to know for certain that you don't have Legionnaires disease. A highly sensitive test would definitely catch anyone that is positive for Legionnaires disease. So if they're not positive, you can be sure that they are negative. Negative results in a high sensitivity test are used to rule out the disease. Snout, sensitivity, rules it out. Specificity. Imagine that everyone in your emergency department felt well, but you were told that you had all been exposed to the SARS virus. The CDC is offering treatment to everyone, but it will cost you $10,000. You would like to be certain that you actually have SARS before spending $10,000 on treatment. A highly specific test would definitively show everyone that is negative for the disease. So if you test positive for SARS, you can be certain that you are not mistakenly positive. A positive result from a test with high specificity means a high probability of the presence of disease. Spin, specificity, rules it in. Today we're gonna to talk about head trauma, C-spine injury, blunt chest trauma, blunt abdominal injury, and lower extremity trauma, including knee, ankle, and foot. Let's start with the head trauma. These are all my cases, as they happened. A 65-year-old male presents in emergency department after falling off a stepladder three hours ago. He lost his balance while he's up fixing the roof. He talks about head pain at the site of impact, denies vomiting, syncope, or any other injuries. His vitals are normal. He does have a small bruise just above his left eye, and when he speaks to me, his eyes are closed throughout the exam. A second case to consider. This is a 24-year-old female who slipped and fell by the pool. She was on the pool deck last night, slipped and fell. Her friend says it was the wine. She admits headache and did actually vomit once after the fall, denies any other injuries. Her vitals are also normal. She does have a tender hematoma noted just above her left ear, and when I look in the ear canal, I do notice a left-sided hemotympanum. Her GCS, however, is 15. Which of these patients do you think needs a CT head? The man who fell off the stepladder? The 24-year-old female who slipped by the pool? Neither or both? Let's consider. We're going to talk about the Canadian CT head rule and the New Orleans criteria, also sometimes referred to as the charity head rules. Let's talk about the Canadian rule first. First of all, you have your five high-risk categories and then your two medium-risk categories. This is for adults greater than 16 years of age with minor head injury. There are five criteria for high-risk neurologic injury and two criteria for medium-risk neurologic injury. The rule does not apply if any of the following are present. If it's not a trauma case, if someone presents with headache, you cannot use this Canadian CT head rule unless they also hit their head. If their GCS is less than 13, this rule is not designed for those patients. If they're less than 16 years of age, this rule cannot be used. And if they have Coumadin or some other bleeding disorder, including the newer 
anticoagulants or Plavix, uh, this rule does not apply. And if they have an obvious open skull fracture, I'm pretty sure all of us would CT that patient. The New Orleans criteria says CT is required for any patients with minor head injury with any one of the following findings. The criteria only apply to patients who also have a GCS of 15. Does the patient have a headache? Has there been vomiting? Are they older than 60 years of age? Is there any drug or alcohol intoxication involved? Do they have persistent anterograde amnesia? In other words, they cannot form new memories. Do they have visible trauma above the clavicle? In other words, neck and up. And have they had a seizure along with this? The Canadian CT head rule is any one of the followings. A Glasgow coma scale less than 15, two hours post-injury, any suspected open or depressed skull fracture, any signs of a basilar skull fracture, and this is what we refer to as our panda eyes or raccoon eyes or the bruising at the base of the mastoid, two or more episodes of vomiting if they're 65 years or older, if they have amnesia before the injury occurred of 30 or more minutes, and finally if it's a dangerous mechanism. This is from 2001 in The Lancet. It was a prospective cohort study in 10 large Canadian hospital emergency departments. Roughly 3,000 patients between 1996 and 1999 who came in with a GCS between 13 and 15 after suffering a head injury. 2,000 of these patients, in other words, about two-thirds, underwent CT scan to look for clinically important injury. The remainder had 14-day telephone follow-up. 1% actually required neurosurgery. An additional 8% were judged to have clinically important brain injuries. 4% were judged to have clinically unimportant lesions, mainly a localized subarachnoid hemorrhage or isolated contusions less than 5 millimeter in diameter. The results? The high-risk factors are 100% sensitive predicting the need for neurologic intervention and would require only approximately one-third of patients to undergo CT. The medium risk factors are pretty good, but not 100%, 98.4 sensitive, and roughly 50% specific predicting clinically important brain injury, and again would require only half of patients to undergo CT. Let's talk about the New Orleans criteria, or also called the charity head rules for the hospital which were they developed. This is from the year 2000, New England Journal of Medicine. It's a single center study at Charity Hospital in New Orleans. Recursive partitioning analysis in another phase one, they took 520 patients ages 3 to 97 years, most of them around age 36, with a GCS score of 15 after minor head injury. Then there was a phase two where they applied these rules that they devised in phase one, looking at roughly 1,000 patients, again ages 3 to 94 years, with a GCS of 15 after minor head injury. The results? Of the 520 patients in the first phase, roughly 7% had positive scans. Among the roughly 1,000 patients in phase two, again, roughly 6% had positive scans. All patients who had a positive CT scan, meaning they found something, had one or more of the seven criteria. This study compares the two, and full disclosure here, the author of the Canadian CT head rules is the one who did this study. This is from JAMA 2005. The New Orleans criteria and the Canadian CT head rule both have 100% sensitivity, However, Canadian CT head rule was more specific, 76%, meaning it found things versus 12% specific for the New Orleans criteria. That is highly um, significant. It also predicts the need for more neurosurgical interventions. For patients with minor head injury and a GCS score of 15, they both have equivalently high sensitivities, but Canadian CT head rule has a higher specificity, meaning you'll have to do less CT scans and the use of it may result in reduced imaging rates. So if we go back to our case, I've highlighted the important details of each case just to help remind you, our 65-year-old male who fell off the stepladder, and finally our 24-year-old female who slipped and fell by the pool deck. Knowing what you know now, which of these patients needs a CT scan? The correct answer is both. Here's our first poll question.
We will give everybody about 10 more seconds to submit their answers. Thank you. Okay, Dr. Hampton, 31% picked A, 6% picked B, 18% picked C, nobody picked D, and 45% picked E. That's very good because E is the correct response. Topic number two, cervical spine injury. Again, here are my real cases. This is an 86-year-old female who presents after a low-speed motor vehicle collision. She was stopped at a light. She's the restrained driver and was struck from behind. She was wearing her seatbelt, but the airbag appropriately did not deploy. She initially was ambulatory and seen, but after the ambulance arrived, now she presents boarded and collared. She's a little uncertain about the date. Her vital signs are normal. She exhibits no midline cervical spine tenderness and has no distracting injuries on exam. This is not the actual photo of my friend that wrecked his bike, but it's pretty close to what happened. 29-year-old male presents after a bicycle accident. He was wearing a helmet and fell face first on the ground. His right wrist is obviously deformed. It looks like the letter S, and he also describes to me neck pain. Again, his vitals are normal. The right wrist is a pretty obvious break. He arrives ambulatory. Which of these patients do you think needs cervical spine imaging? My friend, the bicyclist, our driver, neither or both. Let's consider. Two rules here again, the Canadian C-spine rule, and one which, which I think most of us are familiar, nexus criteria. Let's take nexus first. There's five criteria for this, and you have to meet all five in order for the rule to apply. One, no posterior midline cervical spine tenderness. Two, no evidence of intoxication. The rule writers made this vague on purpose, meaning alcohol, drugs, etc. Three, a normal level of alertness. Four, no focal neurologic deficits. And five, no painful distracting injuries. If you can say yes to all those, you do not need to have any imaging. If any one of them is positive, unfortunately that person really requires radiology. An easy mnemonic for these is NSAID, neurologic deficit, spinal tenderness, altered mental status, intoxication, and distracting injury. Nexus came from a prospective observational study published in 2000 in New England Journal of Medicine. 21 emergency departments across the United States, roughly 34,000 patients who underwent radiography of the cervical spine following blood trauma. Nexus was very, very good. It identified all but eight of the 800 or so patients who had cervical spine injury. In other words, 99% sensitivity. Two of those eight people were classified as unlikely for the injury to be clinically significant. So you could say Nexus really only missed six clinically significant injuries. The Canadian C-spine rule is also for alert adult patients with a GCS of 15. And they first ask, it's a three-step rule. The first step is, are there any high-risk factors that mandate radiography? Older age of 65 or greater. A dangerous mechanism of injury, we'll discuss that in a second. Paresthesias in their upper extremities. Is there, if none of those are present, you go on to part two. Are there any low risk factors that allow safe assessment of range of motion? For instance, a simple rear-ended motor vehicle collision. If they've been seated in the emergency department, or they were ambulatory at any time, or if their neck pain was delayed in onset. Also, do they have an absence of midline cervical spine tenderness? If you meet all of those, then you take the collar off and ask them to actively rotate their head 45 degrees to the left and right. If they can do so, according to the Canadian C-spine rules, no imaging is necessary. This is from JAMA 2001. A prospective cohort study, meaning looking forward, applying the rule moving forward between 1996 and 1999. Again, those same 10 large Canadian community and university hospital emergency departments. Smaller study, around 9,000 adults who presented following blunt trauma to the head and neck with stable vital signs and, again, GCS of 15. The results? Roughly 2%, in other words, 151 people had an important cervical spine injury. The Canadian C-spine rule demonstrated 100% sensitivity and roughly 42% specificity for identifying 151 clinically important cervical spine injuries. 
again, I talk, we, we talk about the dangerous mechanisms. If you've fallen from more than three feet or down five stairs, if it's an axial load of the head, such as diving in a swimming pool that unfortunately didn't have any water in it, a motor vehicle accident at high speed greater than 100 kilometers per hour, rollover, ejection, etc., or a collision involving a motorized recreational vehicle, such as a four-wheeler, three-wheeler, etc., or a bicycle collection, Right away, these are all considered dangerous mechanisms of injury, and therefore, C-spine imaging is mandated. All right. Once again, the two rules are compared, and again, it is, the, it is Ian Steele, the author of the Canadian C-spine rule, that's doing the comparing. So you should be able to guess which one does better. From the New England Journal of Medicine, 2003. A prospective cohort study, again, nine Canadian nurse departments, roughly 9,000 patients, 2% of which had clinically important cervical spine injuries. The results, Canadian C-spine rule was more sensitive, 99.4% versus 90%, and more specific, 45% versus 37% for injury. The Canadian C-spine rule would have missed one patient out of that roughly 9,000. Nexus would have missed 16. So if we go back, our cases, again, I've highlighted the things that I want you to pay attention to, our bicyclist and our elderly female driver. Whether you use Nexus or Canadian C-spine rule, which of these patients need C-spine imaging? And again, the correct answer is both. give everybody about 10 more seconds to submit their answers. Okay, Dr. Hampton, 25% picked A, nobody picked B or C, 23% picked D, and 52% picked E. And again, the majority of the folks have chosen the correct response. We'll go on here to our next case. This is blunt chest trauma. 15-year-old male with chest pain, status post MVC. Mom's minivan, less conformist than the bus. Our young man is a 15-year-old who presents the mirror following a highway speed MVC. He was the restrained passenger in a van that T-boned another car at an intersection. He arrives via ambulance with full longboard and C-spine immobilization. His only complaint is mid-sternal pleuritic chest pain. He denies any other injuries or complaints. He has no medical history. His exam is unremarkable and that he's afebrile. Vital signs are largely normal. Heart regular, chest wall shows no signs of injury, but it is exquisitely tender to palpation. His lungs are clear bilaterally. Due to the chief complaint of chest pain, our auto automatically had the chest pain order set put in. And I believe this is, yep, our poll question. Again, we'll give everybody about 10 more seconds. Dr. Hamden, 5% picked A, 3% picked B, 19% picked C, nobody picked D, and 73% picked E. So here we see that this is a very normal appearing EKG. Incidentally, his troponin is also normal. Here's our second, another poll question. 
I'm going to show you the images first. This, of course, is the AP, excuse me, PA chest X-ray. And here is the lateral chest X-ray. We'll give everybody about 10 more seconds. Thank you. Dr. Hampton, 15% picked A, 4% picked B, 19% picked C, 31% picked both D and E. Okay, only one of those is correct. Let's take a look here. There is the correct response. This young man has a pretty significantly displaced sternal fracture. So, this is the nexus chest decision instrument, or clinical decision instrument for blunt chest trauma. This is to talk about which patients require chest imaging after blunt trauma. It applies to patients greater than 15 years of age with blunt trauma within the past 24 hours. Again, important things to know. Are they older than 60 years of age? Was it a rapid deceleration mechanism? In other words, a fall from greater than 20 feet or motor vehicle collision greater than 40 miles per hour? Do they complain of chest pain? Are they intoxicated? Do they have an otherwise altered mental status? Do they have a distracting painful injury? And furthermore, is there tenderness to the chest wall on palpation? This is the nexus group again, but this time they're looking at chest trauma. It was developed in order to reduce unnecessary chest imaging in blood trauma. The nexus chest decision instrument can rapidly identify very low-risk patients with blunt thoracic trauma who would not benefit from chest imaging. In patients who have all seven criteria negative, it's not a perfect, but it's a less than 2% chance of having any thoracic injury and a 1% chance of having any clinically significant thoracic injuries. This is from JAMA Surgery, October 2013. It was developed prospectively at three separate trauma centers in roughly about 2,500 patients. It was then validated in almost 1,000 patients and classified as either major clinical significance with regard to their injury, minor clinical significance, or no clinical significance. The rule validated was 99.7% sensitive for major thoracic injury, 99% sensitive for major and minor thoracic injury, and roughly 99% sensitive for any thoracic injury. The way the study group recommends that you apply it is for blunt trauma patients in whom chest imaging is being considered, if they have a plus one score, chest x-ray is probably sufficient. If they have two or greater, CT chest is probably indicated. Major clinical significance are the following, any aorta or great vessel injury, a ruptured diaphragm, a hemothorax or pneumothorax, sternal fractures or multiple fractures that actually require an interventional procedure, pulmonary contusion that receive ventilatory assistance, including non-invasive ventilation. The minor clinical significance are the same things but that had no surgical procedure but were managed as an inpatient observation. Sternal or multiple rib fractures also managed as an outpatient. Pulmonary contusion or laceration, but with no ventilatory assistance, but they were observed for more than 24 hours. Of no clinical significance were hemothorax, pneumothorax, pneumomediastinum, and pulmonary contusion or laceration that required both no surgical intervention and were all managed on an outpatient basis. Make sure you understand what the rule is saying here. It's not saying that they don't have injuries. It's saying that they're not clinically significant. Back to our young man. Sternal fractures are relatively uncommon. In fact, in my career, this is the only one I have ever encountered. They usually occur in a male patient and often happen following an MVC. An isolated sternum fracture does not mean the person needs to be admitted. Evaluate the patient for their total injury burden. Sternal fractures rarely cause damage to any underlying structures. Sternal fractures uncommonly require any surgical repair. Indeed, in this instance, this was allowed to heal. A sternal fracture should be viewed as a prompt. What are the associated injuries? 
If there is no pneumothorax, no hemothorax or rib fractures, then very little needs to be done to manage an isolated sternum fracture. So in our patient, he did very well. We did observe him overnight simply for pain control, but ultimately things went extremely well. This is a most recent case that I had. This is actually the text that was sent to a friend of a friend. I'm coming in tomorrow. Never been through anything like this, so I get pretty emotional when I talk or think about it. And that's the car she was traveling in. This is a 22-year-old female who was seen for an abdominal injury while driving her car. She failed to yield at an intersection and T-boned another vehicle. She arrives with a complaint of both abdominal pain as well as right foot pain. Vital signs, other than being a little tachycardic, are unremarkable. She's crying. Her abdomen is tender and visibly bruised at the site of injury. She has a normal chest and back exam, normal breath sounds. Right foot and knee are also visibly swollen and appear to be quite bruised. This is a picture of her right foot. Here's a picture of the right knee. You're looking above it, slightly just kind of over and behind her right shoulder. Here's another image of that same right knee, again, more off to the side this time. And here is a picture of our patient's abdomen. The bruise that you see in her right antecubital fossa is not from an IV start. She came with that. So, the police that accompany the patient assure you she's just a drunk college kid trying to get out of a ticket by pretending to be hurt. You are concerned because the injury may be serious, and last time you checked, being drunk is not protective for more serious intra-abdominal injury. Is there a clinical decision rule that can help guide this patient's need for imaging? And there is. This is the clinical prediction rule for adult abdominal blood trauma. I wish I had to catch your name, but it isn't. This is looking at adult trauma patients greater than 18 years of age at very low risk for any intra-abdominal injuries after blunt torso trauma. This is from Annals of Emergency Medicine, October 2009. The rule has several parts. We'll go through them quickly. Does the patient hypotensive? Do they have a GCS less than 14? Is there costal margin tenderness? Any abdominal tenderness? Did they also break a femur? Do they have blood in their urine, more than 25 RBCs per high power field? Is their hematic rate less than 30%? And do they have an abnormal chest x-ray, such as pneumothorax or rib fractures? This came about in two phases. The derivation phase is where they took roughly 3,000 patients, found those that had intra-abdominal injury, and said, what do all of these folks have in common? That's where they came up with the same criteria. And among those, roughly a third needed an acute intervention. The validation phase, 9% had intra-abdominal injury. This is where they've decided what the rule is and go forward applying it to patients. And again, roughly a third of those patients of the 143 had an acute intervention. What do we mean by acute intervention? Meaning they had a surgical procedure. Any injury present means that they simply identified injury. Now they took the rule and further subdivided it the, way, the following way. Those who needed acute intervention, they didn't look at femur fracture or abnormal chest x-ray. It was simply these six criteria. For any injury present, they removed hypotension, and you ended up with those seven criteria. The final rule incorporates all eight criteria. For acute intervention, if they have any one of these things, the rule is 100% sensitive. If they have any of these seven things, it's not quite as sensitive, 96% but it is 30% specific, and it has a 99% negative predictive value. Oh dear, more statistical definitions. Negative predictive value. This looks at the probability that a disease is absent when the test is negative. The negative predictive value of the test is the proportion of people that don't have disease out of everyone who tests negative for the disease. So negative predictive value is everyone who tests negatives and is negative over all negatives. Total healthy over total rejected. Negative predictive value describes how likely patients with a negative screening test truly don't have disease. Positive predictive value looks at the opposite. It's the probability that a disease is present when the test is positive. The positive predictive value of a test is the proportion of people that have a disease out of everyone who tests positive for the disease. Positive predictive value is everyone who's truly positive over everyone who tests positive. In other words, true disease over total identified. 
positive predictive value describes how likely patients with a positive screening test truly have disease. As we go back to our patient, again, I'm highlighting for you significant pieces of the case. You have the rule to your right, and I ask again, does this patient warrant any imaging studies? And the obvious answer is yes. Thankfully, she had no intra-abdominal injuries, but she did actually have a right foot fracture. Here's our next poll question. Again, we'll give everybody about 10 more seconds to get some more votes in. Dr. Hampton, 26% yes. picked A, 37% picked B, 35% picked C, 2% picked D, and no, nobody picked E. <clears throat> Cody, I, I set my sheet off to the side. You have to remind me what this question was. I apologize. <laughs> it's fine. The question was, a test with a high negative predictive value, NPV, can be best characterized by which of the following? Right. And so all those things that we listed are characteristics of a negative predictive value test. It's good it tells you that how good the test is if it's negative. So I, I, is E all of the above? Am I remembering that correctly? Yes, and also I actually um, did not add that all of the above, so my, my apologies for that. Okay. Lecture outline continued. We're on to the lower extremity. We're looking specifically at the knee. This is a 26-year-old female who had a right knee injury from a soccer match. She was clipped that was her words, by another player and fell. She's helped off the field and she sat out the remainder of the game. Her vitals are normal. The knee is swollen, but she's able to take four steps. There's no pain over the kneecap or fibular head. And she's able to flex the knee to 90 degrees on exam. Does she need x-rays? This is the Ottawa knee rules. And I think when we talk about clinical decision rules, it's both the Ottawa knee rules as well as the Ottawa foot and ankle rules that most people are familiar with. So I had to include these. Knee x-rays are indicated after acute knee injury if any of the following are present. An older patient, age 55 or older, tenderness at the head of the fibula, isolated tenderness of the patella or kneecap, and an inability to flex the knee to 90 degrees, also inability to bear weight. This is defined as to take four steps, in other words, two steps on each leg. They can limp, but they have to actually be able to weight bear. This is from Annals of Emergency Medicine in 1995. Granted, it's an older study, but the rule still is very valid. This was derived from a convenient sample of roughly 1,000 adults with acute knee injuries. It was further validated on a second group of people, adults, again, around 1,000 people. It is 100% sensitive, and this is important, for clinically important fractures. The rule is not designed to find every injury. It's designed only to find clinically important fractures. And it's roughly 50% specific for patients who had no injury. Here's one you may not know, the Pittsburgh decision rule. This is radiography indicated for knee injury with blunt trauma fall as a mechanism with any of the following. This is a much simpler rule. There's only two criteria. Is the patient less than 12 or older than 50? If they are, they need x-rays. The second thing is common to both rules, an inability to walk four weight-bearing steps in the emergency department. This was published a year earlier than the last rule in the American Journal of Emergency Medicine in 1994. Phase one was a retrospective chart analysis. Now keep in mind this is a much smaller study, only 200 patients. Phase two was validation of the rule. Again, very small study, only 133 with independent radiographic findings. The primary outcome, in other words, what are they studying, was correctly identifying fractures. They had 10% roughly fractures in phase two. 
the Pittsburgh decision rule was 100% sensitive and almost 80% specific for correctly identifying fractures. So you knew this was coming, a comparison study followed two years later in the Annals of Emergency Medicine, July 1998. This is a prospective, blinded, multi-center trial in the EDs of three urban teaching hospitals. Again, roughly 1,000 patients with knee pain. The Ottawa knee rule had 750 patients. It found 87 fractures. It missed, however, three fractures for an overall sensitivity of 97% and specificity of 27%. The Pittsburgh decision rule, 745 patients found 91 fractures. The Pittsburgh rule only missed one fracture, making it 99% sensitive and 60% specific. A second study was done just a couple years ago in the American Journal of Emergency Medicine, April 2013. This is again at an urban teaching hospital from 2008 to 2009 looking at isolated knee injuries. These are not polytrauma patients. These are patients presenting with an isolated complaint of knee injury. 90 adult patients with isolated knee injury, seven fractures. The Ottoman knee rule, pooled sensitivity, 86%, specificity, 27%. Pittsburgh, bird farm similarly, 86% sensitive, 51% specific. PDR is more specific than the Ottoman knee rules and with equal sensitivity. However, when you look at who can apply it correctly, people are much better at applying the Pittsburgh decision rule. Why? It's very simple. How old are you? Can you walk? as opposed to the Ottoman knee rule, which has five steps. Going back to our case, there's the two rules for you to reference. Here again is the case, and I've highlighted what I think are the important pieces of the case. Does this patient, by either rule, need radiographic imaging? No. No x-rays are needed. They generally tend to over-x-ray most knee injuries. Continuing on, ankle and foot. This is a 28-year-old male with a left ankle injury. He rolled his ankle while playing basketball. He was briefly weight-bearing initially, but has been non-weight-bearing for the last hour. He has normal vitals. The left ankle is quite swollen. There's bony tenderness along the outside of the ankle, and he actually comes back in a wheelchair. Does he need radiographic imaging? Well, you knew this was coming, of course, the Ottawa ankle rules, or the Ottawa foot and ankle rules. Ankle x-ray is only required if there's pain in the malleolar zone and any one of the following. We'll talk about the malleolar zone in a second. Bony tenderness along the distal 6 centimeters of the posterior edge of the medial malleolus. In other words, the inside of the ankle. Tenderness along the 6 centimeters of the posterior edge of the lateral malleolus or the outside of the ankle. Or, again, this inability to bear weight both immediately and in the emergency department for four steps. Foot x-ray is quite similar to this. Bony tenderness at the base of the fifth metatarsal, in other words, the outside of the foot along the pinky toe. Bony tenderness at the navicular bone, again, inside of the toe, uh, foot, rather, at the, on the big toe side. And again, that inability to bear weight both immediately and within the ED for four steps. This is from JAMA 1993, a convenient sample of 1,000 adults and 450 adults, three adults with acute ankle injuries. Stage two, they had 11% ankle fractures and 4% midfoot fractures. Ottawa ankle foot rules were 100% sensitive for fractures in both the ankle and midfoot. A second study from the British Medical Journal looked at a meta-analysis of 27 studies reporting on more than 15,000 patients. The Ottawa ankle rules performed quite well, again, almost 100% sensitive for excluding fractures of both the ankle and midfoot. So, here's the rules, here's the highlighted portions of the case, and the question, does this patient need radiographic imaging? Yes, he most certainly does. Here's our final poll question. We'll give everybody about 10 more seconds. Thank you.
Okay, Dr. Hampton, 100% noted yes. x-rays. <laughs> and that, of course, is correct. Here's our summary. I learn best by hearing stories. And so I wanted to share my stories with you today. Obviously, these pictures are just simply gathered from the Internet under the co Creative Commons license. They aren't actual pictures other than the right lower corner there of the patient with the abdominal injury of my actual patients, but they are representative of what happened to these folks. I really hope you've enjoyed these stories today. Let's just talk about our rules one more time. With regard to head injury, we have two rules, the Canadian CT head rule and the New Orleans criteria, also occasionally referred to as the charity head rules. My recommendation here would be if they fall, if you're able to exclude them using the New Orleans criteria, you're done. It's very simple. It performs very well. However, if they would happen to rule in with that, I, think I would encourage you to use the Canadian CT head rules. You'll be able to avoid imaging in far more patients, and it performs exceptionally well, 100% sensitivity. With regard to C-spine injury, we have the Canadian C-spine rule, as well as the Nexus criteria. Nexus criteria is very elegant. It's only five things. It has the mnemonic NSAID and performs extremely well. Canadian C-spine rule performs slightly better when you look at a large group of patients. However, either rule is completely acceptable to use and will allow you to both say who needs imaging and who can you safely say does not need imaging. With regard to chest trauma, the rule that I've recently found is the Nexus Clinical Decision Instrument for Blunt Chest Trauma. Again, this performs very well. It's nice and it allows you to make good clinical decisions based on evidence. The clinical prediction rule for adult abdominal blood trauma also performs well. Keep in mind, um, most of us, I think, if there were someone presented with hypotension or altered mental status, we almost certainly would image those folks. So that's kind of a silly part of the rule. The Ottoman knee rules, most of us are familiar with. Perhaps you've not heard of the Pittsburgh decision rule. For the most part, we image way too many knees that we need to. If the patient can walk, it's unlikely that they have any fracture. They may have ligamentous injury of the knee, but x-rays will not help us find that. If the patient's ambulatory, it discourage you from er ordering knee x-rays. And lastly, the auto foot and ankle rules, these perform very well. The one I like so much about this one is I have used this one being on the sidelines of events so many times. People know that I'm a doc. We live in a small community. Someone will come up to me. They're hurt. I can quickly go through these rules and tell them, you know what, you're okay. You probably don't have a fracture. If it gets worse, get it rechecked. But if not, you're doing fine. Or I can tell them, you know what, you probably broke something. That really should have some further imaging. We have a few minutes left. I hope there are some questions that we can talk about and discuss. Um, I look forward to responding to those. Again, if you have any questions, you can type them into the question queue box on the, the toolbar. As of now, we don't have any, but we can wait a few moments to see if we receive any. While we're waiting for some questions to come forward, just a couple more thoughts about the clinical decision rules. These should support you. They shouldn't go against what you're thinking. So if you see someone who is injured and you think they need imaging, feel, pursue that, work that patient up, advocate for that patient. Similarly, if you see someone that doesn't appear to be all that injured, the rule can act as a little checklist to make sure you're not overlooking something more significant. Um, they both really they, they work very nicely for that, allowing you to make good clinical decisions and advocate for your patient. One other thing to mention, all of the slides, the references, everything is included as a PDF handout. Um, please feel free to download that, to share it with colleagues. Uh, I hope that these are practice changing, this is practice changing information for you and furthermore validating the good work that you're already doing. 
Okay. Thank you, Dr. Hampton. It doesn't appear we are receiving any more questions, so we can go ahead and end this session. Again, if you are attending the session live, you will receive an email about one hour after, one hour from now, with directions on how to complete the evaluation. And your certificate will be emailed approximately 7 to 14 days after today's event. If you have any questions for myself or Dr. Hampton, you can send them to me at info at traumanurses.org. Thank you very much for attending, and have a great day. Thank you.